Our lives are powered by batteries. This started about 50 years ago with the advent of the battery-powered watch, which replaced the mechanical inconvenience of having to wind your watch every day with replacing a battery once every year or so. Now, flash forward to today, it's changed, right? We depend upon battery-powered devices for a number of things, mobile phones, GPS receivers. We even have pacemakers that require batteries that literally keep our hearts beating. And we depend upon these so critically because their performance is incredible. And what's underlied that performance is a number of the individual components improving with respect to time. So let me show you a little bit of data. This is 13 years from 1990 to 2003. And the first thing I want to show you is processor speed. And if you look at processor speed during this time, it's doubled every 18 months. So that over that time period, the increase in performance has been nearly a thousand fold. That's great news. The bad news is that batteries haven't kept up. Over that same period of time, a trend that's continued on to today is that battery performance, measured as the energy per unit mass, has essentially flatlined. The performance has not improved. It's right there on the bottom there. So batteries have really constrained how the, the sophistication of these, of these portable devices. And we've gone from a situation where we could replace a watch battery every year to the case where we have to charge our batteries every day. right? We can sometimes go longer between meals than we can between battery charges. <laughs> and uh, in the supposedly wireless world, there's still one wire that remains, and that's the one that tethers us to the grid. And I want to cut that wire, and I want to do so by tapping into, into your power. Now, you may not have thought about it quite this way, but you guys are an incredible source of portable and reliable electricity. So let's think this through first. So let's begin with, with the energy that you eat. You guys eat food. Now it turns out that food, like this granola bar, has about 100 times as much energy per unit mass as batteries. That means you can either bring along a 2-ounce granola bar or a 12-pound lithium-ion battery, okay, in terms of the amount of useful energy that's available. And you store energy in your body as fat. That's the, that's the most dense food there is, and that's the way you store it in your body. And the average person is about 15% fat which makes you roughly equivalent to a one-ton battery stored in your body. And you can take that stored energy and you can deliver it at very high rates. You know, one of our, the best people we have at this is Lance Armstrong, the, the competitive cyclist. And he can put out 1,000 watts of mechanical power for, for, for a good amount of time. And if, if it were technically possible, at that rate, you could charge a mobile phone battery in less than 15 seconds. Okay, so we have high potential to deliver this power. And, and, you know, and, and the reality is we've known this for a long period of time. We've tapped into human power for millennia. We built the pyramids of Giza with human power. We built the Great Wall of China with human power. Um, perhaps the people who most appreciated the potential of human power was, was that the, uh, during the Industrial Revolution, where accountants would carefully measure and quantify the ability of people to do work in order to make decisions like, should I hire 10 more people or should I buy a steam engine? And we celebrate human power. In our folklore, for example, people like John Henry, the steel driving man, who outdrove a steam-powered drill with just his muscles and his hammer. And our modern-day folk heroes, some of them are because of their ability to generate power, like I've already mentioned Lance, Lance Armstrong, or Usain Bolt, the sprinter. And, and, and my personal favorite example of the heights at which human power have taken us is the Gossamer Albatross. So this is a collaboration between aeronautical engineers and exercise physiologists to, to build the first human-powered airplane to fly across the English Channel. And they were successful. So think about this for a second. One of us, one of you or I, one of us, has flown using only their muscle, right? And, 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 and a plane, but nevertheless, <laughs> their muscle. Okay, so incredible across the English Channel. Now, if you compare these achievements to how we've tapped into human power to produce electricity, I would say our successes have been rather more modest. So the most commercially successful human power generation machine is a hand crank flashlight. It's perfectly suited for its task, which is to sit on a shelf for a long period of time um, until um, an emergency situation where the power goes down, and then you are perfectly willing, if not excited, to find it, <laughs> turn the hand crank, produce electricity, and probably the first thing you do is go look for matches or batteries, right? But nevertheless, it, it helps you out. Now, people are much less willing to turn a hand crank to power their mobile phones, right? And, they're, and that's for two of the best reasons in the world. Time and effort. 
When you're turning a hand crank, you have to dedicate yourself to that task. You can't really do much else except think. And when you're turning a hand crank, it, 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 it requires your effort. I mean, if it's, you're trying to produce enough power, you are going to sweat. And if there's two things that people don't like to do, it's to waste their time and waste their energy. So what we wondered is whether or not we could remove those two barriers to tapping into the power of people and allow people to produce reliable and portable electricity for other tasks. So we wondered, rather than have people dedicate themselves to producing power, what if we did in the background while they go about their everyday activities? And so you need to think of a logical activity to focus on, and, and, and that would be one that people do often. So for us, that's walking. And as soon as you target walking, then there's a logical place that you want to go, and that's where the muscles and the legs are, because they are the powerhouse in the body. And in particular, we focused on the knee. And so that's what I want to show you today and give you a little demo of how that works, our bionic energy harvester. Thank you. This is my dad, everybody. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. So here's, here's the bionic energy harvester. This is the latest prototype. It consists of a brace platform and a gearbox. And inside this gearbox is both gears and a generator. It's built by um, a Vancouver-based company called Bionic Power. And uh, so it, we're essentially entering into a uh, relationship with the human body when you try and harvest energy from people. So that means you need to understand its terms. And its terms are it needs to be comfortable. And so we spend a lot of time thinking about how to design this to be comfortable, including a number of ergonomic features. Um, one of those is to make it long so that the forces on the body are relatively small. It also needs to be relatively lightweight. This version weighs about uh, uh, two pounds, so about, about a kilogram. Usually we have one on each leg, but I'm just going to show you one on this leg for the time being. We think a lot about strapping because that's part of what makes it comfortable for people. All right, it's on. And uh, so now when I'm going about my everyday activities, like walking, it can harvest energy in the background while I'm, while I'm doing that. And what's happening is every time I, f I flex or extend my knee joint, it spins gears which spin a generator. The gears are needed because knee motion is actually relatively slow. And so you need to step up that speed um, in order to produce energy uh, efficiently with that, with that generator. Okay, so that's the time side of things. Let me tell you next about the effort side of things. Now, it might seem like you're breaking some fundamental laws of thermodynamics to imagine that you can get energy for free, right? That's what I'm saying. No effort. I want to get electricity from you for no effort. But that's not true because you're already requiring the person to be moving, like walking. So the idea is you might be able to make that movement more efficient if you, if you harvest the energy in the correct way. And the reason for that is because muscles have two jobs when, when they're working during walking or most other tasks. One job is to act like motors, which is probably the way you think of muscles working. So when they're acting like motors, they're acting to lift and accelerate you. But their second job is they act like brakes, which is to lower you down or slow you down. And so when they're acting like brakes, if you could use a generator instead to slow you down, you could save the muscles from what they're doing while producing electricity at the same time. This is just like regenerative braking in a hybrid car, but applied to the body. So let me try and make that a little less abstract by talking about standing up and sitting down, okay? So when I'm, when I'm sitting down and I go to stand up, my quadriceps, these knee extensor muscles, act like motors and lift me up, right? And when I go to sit down, those same muscles are active, but now they're lowering me down, acting like brakes. So the same muscles, two tasks. If I put a generator here, it's going to resist my motion when I'm standing up, making it harder to stand up, but it's going to assist me when I sit down making it easier to sit down. Now imagine if I could disengage and engage that generator, so I'm going to disengage it when I stand up, so standing up is the same as normal, and engage it when I'm sitting down, and now it makes sitting down easier, right? Because it's resisting my motion sitting down. I only get energy during half the cycle, but it doesn't cost me any extra energy and may even be able to assist me. Now we don't actually care about standing up and sitting down that much, but the same thing applies during walking, where there are periods of time, for example, when at the beginning of the stance phase, when your knee joint is accepting the weight of your body, where these muscles are on and they are acting like brakes, where you can use a generator to assist them in doing that. And then you get out of the way later in order to not cost you extra energy. Um, and that requires it to have some intelligence. And that intelligence isn't in here, it's in the computer that goes along with it. 
Thank you, Dad. I can take this too now. And uh, that's in here. And so what this does is it senses where you are in the walking cycle and engages or disengages the generator. And it actually doesn't engage it and disengage it mechanically. That's why you can hear it all the time. It does it electronically, meaning it allow, either allows it to generate current or not allow it to generate current. It says, okay, give me energy during this braking phase and so you can get it for free. And we can verify that, in fact, does work with careful lab experimentation where you measure the extra effort by your oxygen consumption and carbon dioxide production, as well as your local muscle activity using what's called EMG, which is just like EKG, but applied to, applied to the muscles of the leg. And uh, indeed, you get that energy without additional cost. In fact, when you're walking downhill, when there's a lot of braking going on, you can make it considerably easier by harvesting energy at the same time. So I'd like to show you how that works. Um, but I can promise you that watching a battery charge is about as exciting as watching paint dry. So I'm going to do something which we don't, um, which we don't in intend it's used to before, but um, I'm going to show you that anyway. And that is just to light a light. And it's not operating in, this, in the intelligent mode when, uh, in this case, it's just going to be generating it continuously. And I'm going to give a couple kicks. It's going to take a little while, a couple kicks to light this light, because there's no battery in here. There's no magic in here. All the energy is coming from my knee joint. Okay? And I'll stand over here a little bit. Let's see, sure. I don't want to fall over. It's good, eh? <laughs> there you go. Okay, so I've done that a million times. I love it still. <laughs> okay, so let's time and effort. Although that demo required me extra effort. When it's applied during walking, that's not the case. But where the rubber meets the road for energy harvesting for any kind of power generation is how much power you get. And we get about 12 watts on average during walking. That's not peak power, that's, what, that's the average power into a battery. And so for, for one minute of walking, what 12 watts means is you can get about half an hour of talk time on a typical mobile phone. So one minute walking, half an hour talk time. Now I don't imagine many of you in this room are gonna run out and buy one of these to charge your cell phones when you live close to the grid. The early adopters are people whose lives depend upon portable power and don't have easy access to the grid. That includes first responders. After disasters like Hurricane Katrina or the tsunami in Japan, power grids go down, communication grids go down. These rescue workers have to go in, they have to keep, their, keep in contact with two-ray radios, they have to know where they are with GPSs. To do so, they need battery power, but delivering batteries to disaster areas is very difficult because by their very definition, you don't know how big they're going to be or how long they're going to last. So imagine if they could produce their own energy as they walk. Modern militaries rely upon batteries like they rely upon food and water. And they need it to stay in contact with each other and to find the way back to base safely. Many um, modern medical devices require batteries, and in particular prosthetic limbs, which used to be these passive mechanical devices, but now are essentially wearable robots that have computers inside that adjust to the terrain you're walking on and have motors that allow them, people to walk upstairs or uphill. And uh, so imagine if your healthy leg could charge your artificial leg just as you walk. Now perhaps those most in need are those in the developing world, where 1.6 billion people still live without access to electricity. For example, uh, Uganda. 1% of Ugandans have access to reliable electricity, 1%. In, in rural India, there's over 400 million people without access to electricity. Compare that to Canada, where the number is essentially indistinguishable from zero, right? And uh, it's, it's, not that, it's not that these people don't have a need for electricity, they do. The New York Times recently told a story about a Kenyan farmer named Sarah Rudu, who uses her mobile phone to check market prices for her crops, to talk to her family, to make small money transfers. And at the end of each week, she'd walk for two miles to hire a motorcycle to drive her for three hours to the nearest town with electricity, where she'd have to leave her phone for three days to be charged because the lineup for phone charging was so long. The, the, the need that I particularly hope that we can address is for health. 
Many of our essential health technologies that we rely upon in North America assume access to electrical power grid and have built that way. And so they don't work very well in energy poor environments like sub-Saharan Africa or rural India. And so we, want, we think that we can help out by powering um, from the energy that, that people have in their own bodies. And in, in particular, over the next two years, we're going to target four particular applications that make sense. The first is, in the top left, is UV ultraviolet water purification to remove waterborne diseases such as diarrhea and cholera. The second is what's called point-of-care diagnostics, which are equipment that can be used to, to diagnose and treat HIV and AIDS and other diseases such as those. Vaccine refrigeration to immunize against debilitating diseases such as measles or pertussis. And finally, mobile phones. So while electricity is scarce in these developing countries, mobile phones are not. They are pervasive and increasingly used for health education, including pre- and postnatal care. So five minutes of walking with our technology can purify five liters of water, can power the equipment for one HIV test, can keep 280 vaccine doses cold for an hour, and can give you two and a half hours of talk time on a typical mobile phone. So my hope is that in the not-so-distant future, health workers will be able to power their equipment as they walk between villages, and a parent will be able to clean drinking water for their child as they walk back from the nearest water source, uh, and all by tapping into the power of people. So, thank you.